everything we think and say and do. You know the truth behind what we say and the words that come from our mouth, the reality of our twisted feelings and our own selfish desires. You know these hearts of ours. Lord, you know already if we have sung with sincerity, praise this morning. You know the attitudes with which we have come into your presence and sat amongst your people. You know if our minds are set on you. And yet, Lord, you know the weaknesses we feel. You know the thoughts that distract us and the sins that detract from experiencing that fearful joy that we've already read about in Psalm 2, but yet that joy in your presence. Lord, we admit that sometimes we think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Sometimes we fall into shame and act like strangers to your mercy living like orphans without a knowledge of our Father above or your Spirit who lives within. And so we would ask that you would cleanse us afresh, that you would renew us by your Spirit, that you would take our sins and hide them away in Christ, and that you would accept us not in our own standing and because of our own fickle, fail hearts but because of that true, pure, and spotless heart, the heart of Christ, the one who died in our place so that we might be forgiven. And so we pray in that loving and heart-transforming name, the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to God's Word as we read it together. And boys and girls, I'm going to talk to you about this in a few moments whenever you come down to the front. So I want you to follow along with mum or dad or granny or granddad or whoever you're with today. So let's turn first of all to Acts chapter 17. Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 17. And we're going to read a, a few verses there before we read from First Thessalonians as well. Let's get a bit of the background to the church that we're going to be thinking about, the church in Thessalonica. So let's read, first of all, how this church came about in Acts chapter 17 today. Let's read God's word together. Acts 17 from verse 1. This is God's word. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city into an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And then let's turn on in our New Testaments to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to read the first few verses as we think about this church today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and the first few verses. Paul Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And this is God's word to us today. 
Boys and girls, I see a few of you here today. Do you want to come down to the front? I'd love to get to know you and get chatting to you this morning. So go on down to the front and we'll get a chat down there. I've got two here. Anyone else? Come on down. Love to see you. There we go. Plenty of space at the front here, girls. Right, good to see you. And those of you who are sitting out there as well, lovely to see you as well this morning. Now, I want you to help me a little bit this morning, could you? Because I'm going to put something up on the screen and I need to explain it to you, first of all, so we can all understand what's going on. So the guys at the back, we're going to put some, a verse from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 up on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. And I want you to see there's some words that are in big and bold, either in red or in blue, that stand out a wee bit. So let me read it to you first of all. It says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you. Now, who can see the words in red? Hands up. Can anyone? Anyone see the words in red? Now, could you say those words in red? Could you have a go at any of the words that are in red? Good man, go ahead. Okay, imitators and model. Do you see the words in red? Imitators and model. Could everyone in the congregation this morning say it with us? Two words in red. Imitators, model. Now, you see, the thing about imitators and model, whenever you see them up there, the reason I've got them in red, that almost means exactly the same. If you're an imitator, you're a bit of a model to someone. Let me give you an example. I've got some things in here to help me. Okay. Now, any boys in here or girls like football? Anyone got this one? FIFA? Have you seen this? Oh, aye, aye. There's a few FIFA, right? You know, in the Xbox or the PlayStation. Right. Now, you see when you play FIFA or play a computer game, you're not actually playing football. It's just like being a model. It's like imitating the game. So if you're trying to, who's this, Mbappe on the front, if you're trying to be this famous footballer, you're controlling it in your hands with a computer joystick or your little console or whatever it is, but you're not actually that person. I know some of us think we are when we're playing. You know, when they score the goal and you run around the room thinking you've beaten your brother or sister at it. You know what? It's just an imitation. It's just a model. It's not the real thing. It's just an example. Right, there's one example. Here's another one, okay? Right, I had to dig this one out at home this morning. Now, one of our kids at home is really loves, what's that? Does anyone know what that is? Do you know what that is, girls? What is it? It's a model of what? Does anyone know out there what that is? It's a model of what? What is it? Planet. It's the planets. It's the solar system. It's space, right? Did, can you see, which one do you think is Earth? Can, do you know which one? Yeah, there, that one there. Look, it's, it's the blue and the green, isn't it? And then you've got the sun around which they all move and so on. Look at that. You've got all the different planets and how far away they are. If I were to line them up all in the right order, it tells you how far away each of them would be from the sun. Now, is that the solar system? Is it? Yes, it is. But it's not. It's just a model, isn't it? We couldn't fit the solar system in the mold. I know you've done a great renovation here, but you know you couldn't get the whole of the solar system in the Molesworth this morning. It's just a model. It's just an example. It's not actually the real thing. Anyone like Lego? Like Lego? Right, now I was in a Lego shop a few years ago and I got these made. Do you want to see them? Here we go. Right, there are five all together. Here we go. Now, see that one there? Does he look like anybody? <laughs> Does he look like anybody? It's meant to be me. I got a Lego man and I was able to put hair on and you see he's got the glasses and he's looking very smart. He's even got the stubbly wee beard there and all. Look, look at that. And then this is my wife. She's a doctor. Look, so they've got the stethoscope and all around her. It looks just like her. It really does. She's about that height too, right? You know, she's the smallest in our family now, believe it or not, right? And that, but we didn't just only get uh, Julie, my wife, and I, but we also got, where are the rest? These are our children. So even our children aren't here today. You get to see a bit of what they look like. There's Andrew. He's got spiky hair. There you go. There's Rosie. She's the wee one. 
with the long blonde hair. And there's Amy. She always likes wearing sports gear, so she's got a big A for Amy. Look, there you go. You've never met our family, but there you've seen them all today. Look at that. There's our, but is that them? No, it's just a model, right? It's, they're not the real thing. Okay. Here's the last one. I love these. Does anyone have one of these at home? So I sometimes have you been, do you have, but like that, do you have the real thing or the model? Volkswagen camper van. These are getting very popular again at weddings and all sorts of things. This one is the bride arrives at church and so I've seen that a few times. It's not the real thing, but it's, it's nice, isn't it? It looks like it, but it's not the real thing. You see, all of these are models. They're just like something else, but it's not the real thing. Now, I wonder if we could put up the next slide as well, and we'll have a quick look at that on the screen here, where it tells us about how the imitation works. You see, the church we're thinking about today, and I want you to listen really well, because I know you're not going out to Sunday School or Children's Church this morning. I want you to listen really well. First of all, the people what we're going to hear about today love Jesus. He was the one who died for them, the one who died to forgive them for their sins. He was the one they always thought about first. But then there came Paul and his friends, right? Paul and his friends. So Paul and his friends thought, well, if we are going to be people who love Jesus, we want to look like Jesus. They weren't actually Jesus, but they wanted to be like a, a model to, to reflect something of what Jesus was like. So whenever Paul and his friends traveled around all these cities like Greece and they traveled to uh, Philippi and Thessalonica, like we're going to be thinking about today, they, they tried to live their lives like Jesus. They think about what happened to Jesus. Jesus is the only person who lived a perfectly good life, and yet the people didn't like him, and they crucified him. And sometimes that happens, and whenever we try to live like Jesus, sometimes people don't like us. People think, oh, I don't believe that, or you shouldn't be saying that, or that's not right, that's not what I believe. And sometimes whenever we try and live a life that looks like Jesus, is like a model of Jesus, we rub up against people because they don't like to hear about Jesus and they need forgiveness of their sins. So Paul and Silas and his friends, they all went about following Jesus. But then the next group we're going to hear about are the Thessalonians. There we go. I think they're going to pop up. The Christians in church, that's us. So whenever we read our Bibles, read first of all about Jesus who lived and died for us. And he is our example. Then we read about Paul, who tried to be a copy Jesus, who tried to live a life like Jesus. And then it comes down to Christians in church like us today. Whether it's the Thessalonians we're going to read about, the people in the story we've read today, or people like us in church. And then you see what happens with the last one. Let's see, pop it up the last one. We are to be an example to the people around us. So do you see how it works? Jesus is our example. Paul became an example. We are to be an example to the people who are around about us. And even though we aren't the real thing, we are not Jesus. None of us are perfect enough to be Jesus. Our lives are meant to be lived in such a way that we're meant to show Jesus off to others. Now, let's have a look at what the next thing in the slide says, because this is really important. Whenever things get tough, and everyone in Molesworth has had a tough time at some point, it might be a hard time at school. It might be a hard time at home. It might be a hard time in your family. Everyone goes through difficult times, but it's in the hard times that sometimes it's shown most if we really love and follow Jesus. Someone said this to me whenever I was about 12 years old. David, it's not how you act. It's how you react. So day by day, as you go about your life, if things are going fine, everyone's great. Everything's cushy, everything's good. But see, when something comes against you and it doesn't work out the way, how do you react? Are we like Jesus? Are we calm? Are we patient? Are we forgiving? Do we show the love of Jesus and how we react? Because you see, the very last thing it says, and we're, here's a trailer for tonight. Bring out the mums and dads back out to the evening service tonight. We're going to read about this this evening. There's an example that it says in Thessalonians that people who are Christians are like, they're like a, what's that? A bell. Where do you hear a bell? Tell me somewhere in life where you hear a bell. Where do you hear a bell? Where the cow, cows might have a bell. Or maybe if you're up in the Alps or something like that. Especially. Where else might you hear a, where do you hear a bell most days? Or maybe it's a buzzer. Where do you hear a bell? And you go to school. Do you hear a bell? What does the bell do? 
the bell goes and that means it's the start of school. The bell goes at three o'clock and it's, hey, we're out of school. The bell is a signal about something else. Usually something that starts or stops, that sends out a sign all the way around a school, all the way around an area. Sometimes it's a good sign. Sometimes it's a warning sign. And we are told that we are to be like bells that ring out around the people around about us so they can hear and see the kind of lives that we live. So, big words on the screen this morning. What were the red words? Imitators and model so that we can ring out the message of Jesus wherever we are. Okay, boys and girls, let's put our hands together like this. Okay, and let me pray for you just now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have called us to be examples, imitators, models of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And we pray that for all the boys and girls, all the young people here who are in school every day, even into this last week of school or into this last week of exams, maybe for some as well, that you would help us to be an example to the people around about us and how we love you and in how we serve you and how we follow you. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the only perfect one who ever lived. And we thank you that he is the one who died in our place. So may we live lives that please him and may we be good models and imitators of Jesus so the good news might ring out from us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Boys and girls, good to see you. Do you want to go back to your seats? You go back to your seats. Sharon's going to help us and lead us in a praise now as we sing, My Hope is in the Lord. Can the kiddies come up with me, please? Oh. Hannah. Anybody else who was up, Willow and Heidi? And if anybody else wants to come up, any of the boys or Hannah? If you don't, don't worry. This is one that we did in Children's Day. And it feels like it must have been about four months ago because I can't remember the actions. So these guys are going to help me, okay? And then at the end, there's little uh, folders that Tom has left for you to complete some worksheets and some sweeties and some pencils. If you can just leave the pencils back. Um, but anybody who wants to come up and get those can do so after the song. <laughs> Pick a key, any key. He will never let me 
Anybody who wants to come up and get a little folder, please come up and do so now. Yeah, do you want to come and grab those now? Any boys and girls who want to do that? Thanks, Sharon, for leading us in that. Now, this morning, we're going to get an update from Catherine Marcus about the Care for the Family Pregnancy Crisis Centre. So we're going to hand over to Catherine just now, and she's going to share about that. Thanks, Catherine. Good morning, folks. I've made a, a few promises to a few people that I won't speak too long, which uh, you know I am perfectly capable of. So I don't know, Mark, do you want to borrow David's bell there? You can give it a wee ring <laughs> for me. Um, <laughs> hopefully I'll not keep you too long. Um, but as I've said to you before, when I'm talking about this, I'll put my serious hat on because this is such important stuff. Um, so I really wanted to take a few minutes to update you on something that I've spoken about over the last three years or so. Um, specifically supporting women and girls who are facing a crisis pregnancy. You'll forgive me if I read mostly because I don't want to forget um, what it is that I want to say this morning. So I'll briefly go back because I know there's, there's quite a few people, new people in the church who weren't here when this all began. But if I go back to October 2019, as this is when the seed was planted that we simply need to do more. Um, October 2019 is when abortion was decriminalised in Northern Ireland as a result of a proposal made by MP Stella Creasley in Westminster. Devolution was not restored in time to stop this law being passed here in Northern Ireland, and so a significant shift began. Just prior to this change, we had Don McAvoy from Both Lives Matter here, um, visit us here in our church building, and the strong message that came across, among many things, but the strong message we got that touched our hearts really was that no matter what would happen with the law, whether it went through or not, we need to do more. We need to do more than point fingers and say that abortion is wrong. We need to, as God's family, openly support women and girls in crisis pregnancy situations. We need to be part of the alternative to abortion. And as I stand here now, I take the chance just to say to us in our little corner of God's church, our little part of God's family, that we will support any of you or your friends or your family should you be facing a pregnancy situation and you don't know what to do. Whatever your circumstances, we're here for you. I don't intend to get into the politics of what has happened in Northern Ireland over the past three years, because that certainly would take longer than 10 minutes. Um, you can see so much of that yourself. And I'm not going to talk too much even about the law surrounding abortion. Um, really, what I want to talk to you about is the fact that we have to face the fact that abortion is readily available now in Northern Ireland, particularly medical abortion, which is through the taking of pills. But what I really want to focus on is what a group of us Christian women and men from Northern Ireland have been doing over the last three years to try to be part of the alternative. So in January 2000, a large group of folks met in Hope Church in Hillsborough to meet with Judy McGibbon, the director of Pregnancy Centres Network in England. Judy has just retired from her role. Um, however, before doing so, she spoke to us about centres in England that provide a whole range of support for people in crisis pregnancy situations. They are a Christian organisation and the Christian faith underpins everything that they do. The result of this meeting was that about 20 of us, I think there was maybe 24 of us, but I can't be 100% sure on that, um, signed up to become crisis pregnancy practitioners. Um, we embarked on a level three accredited training course to do just that, with the plan to open centres of a similar nature here in Northern Ireland. Of course, as we well know, COVID then hit, but <clears throat> thankfully that didn't stop us. And in fact, for some of us, it made the training a wee bit easier um, because instead of having to go in person to Hillsborough, we did our training online. Following on from this, a number of us went on to complete a post-abortion training course aiming to support women and girls who are struggling as a result of having had an abortion. This was an incredibly challenging course, and I'm sure that wasn't just for me. I had to dig very deep inside to put aside my own prejudices 
and to soften my heart to the fact that women who have made this choice still have every right to our support. We strongly rely on the example that Jesus gives us, as we've even heard about this morning already. We believe that we should be showing mercy and compassion to the people that we meet, just as he did. He met people in the most murky of circumstances and showed them great grace and compassion. However, without departing from the truth of what is right and what is wrong in God's eyes. During this time, in the background, a board of trustees was formed who were working on putting together physical centres in Northern Ireland and allocating practitioners to the different centres. In February of this year, I was asked to join the board of trustees. It has been an incredibly busy time, writing numerous policies, policies I didn't even know existed, policies about policies and so on, embarking on necessary training, setting up our accounts, having our website built, purchasing suitable resources, securing premises, and so on. And I'm delighted to say that we launch as a charitable organization called Pregnancy Choices Center, not this week, but next. We hope to begin with a center in Enniskillen and one in Belfast, based solely on the fact that that's where most of our volunteers are from. But we also hope that we'll be able to offer nationwide support online. So what exactly is it that we will offer? So for now, our centres will be solely offering a talking service similar to counselling, but I should be clear, we are not all qualified counsellors, although some of us are. We are trained to offer support in particular for anyone who is pregnant and does not know what to do. Anyone who finds their circumstances have changed during pregnancy, for example, maybe a life-limiting diagnosis during their pregnancy, or a woman or a girl who has had an abortion and is struggling as a result. We will also help signpost people to further support that is available to them in Northern Ireland and in the lo their local area. I must emphasize that we are a non-directional service, and that's something that I know some folks may struggle with. What that means is that we will work e with each person to explore all the options that are available to them, and that does include abortion. I know this is something that you may find challenging. I know I certainly did as I was training. Um, even some of you listening today may wonder why we would talk about that option. But the fact is, abortion is available. Not talking about it doesn't make it real or not real. Um, and to pretend otherwise could create potentially even more confusion and distress. So what we will aim to do is speak the truth into all the options that are available giving the person with us the time and space to explore what her head and her heart are saying, respecting the autonomy that God has given her. And the most important thing is that we will fervently pray for every person that we meet. We have already connected with the Association of Christian GPs, and we are hopeful that, similar to our colleagues in England, we will make links with organisations such as Women's Aid and with the PSNI. When we launch in just over a couple of weeks' time, we will have contact details on our website um, and flyers and business cards so people will know who we are and how to contact us. I'll share our website with you um, whenever we do launch, and I'd really encourage you to have a good look at the website. Um, it gives you a really good insight and deeper understanding as to who we are and what we're about. As time goes on, we are very hopeful to have more centres across Northern Ireland. Um, by the autumn term, we should have a centre open in Bangor as well. So I'm going to ask you to pray, and I'm going to give you a couple of pray prayer points. Um, there's so much I could ask for, but I've shortened it down into four things, really. Firstly, could you pray for all our volunteers, for the trustees, and particularly for our centre leaders? We all need God's wisdom. We need his grace, and we very much need his protection. Could you pray that women and girls would take the courageous step to get in contact with us? Because it does take courage. We also really, really do need more practitioners. The more people we have, the more support we can offer. I don't know if any of you have ever looked for any sort of um, therapeutic or, or any sort of support within the Mid-Ulster area, but it is staggering the lack of support that there is in this part of the world. So pray for our wee area um, and that folks would maybe be moved to take the step to train and join us. And the good news is the training is now going to be online, so um, it makes it a lot more accessible. And finally, just ask very simply, but so importantly, that you pray for the protection of the unborn here in Northern Ireland. Thank you so much for listening.
I would say, if there's any questions, you can talk to me afterwards, but unfortunately today, Johnny and I need to rush off, but you can get me any other time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Catherine, thank you for sharing that with us. That's a tremendously uh, important uh, work going on, and we're going to take a moment or two to pray for that work, as well as other families and individuals in need today. Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you mindful that you are the creator, that each and every individual that you have created is one in whom reflect the beauty and greatness of our God. Father, we thank you that the way you've established this world, you have done so in families so that you might bring protection within our society and the environments in which we live. And we thank you for every individual and every family represented here today. But we're also mindful of those many families and individuals who find themselves in moments of crisis. And we think especially across our problems today of, of those women and girls who find themselves pregnant and not knowing where to turn or how they should feel or the direction they should take. We thank you for this Christian influence through the family pregnancy crisis centers. We thank you for the facilitators, for the administrators, for those involved in counseling, those at the other end of a phone, as well as those who meet face to face, and for all the practicalities that surround that, and all the delicacies of speaking to individuals at such a, a fragile moment in their lives, or we do pray for protection for those who counsel, as well as those who receive that direction and counseling. Father, we pray that you would be at work in these centers that have been established and those that are proposed in the months to come. And even for this Mid-Ulster area, which Catherine has referred to, Lord, we know that there is a huge lack of help and support medically for counseling for those with any kind of mental health issues as well. Lord, we do pray for any who are struggling today and find themselves at their wit's end that they might find direction and comfort and support from the right agencies. And may we play our part as the church in its broadest form, as individuals who seek to support and help those, whether it be neighbors or friends or family members who are going through difficult days. And we do pray for the families within our own congregation of Molesworth here today. We pray for those who are going through personal difficulties, those who are maybe caring for elderly relatives, those who have concern for younger family members. We pray for others who have gone through the pain of maybe separation or divorce or hurt or mistrust within a family circle, alongside those who are struggling due to illness or bereavement, and for them the cost and the pain is very different. Father, may we be those who reflect this model we've already been speaking about to the boys and girls, where Christ is our example, that we follow the direction that is given by him, and on this Father's Day, we look to you as a loving Father in heaven, the one above us, but the one who came among us. And we thank you for the comfort and strength that you give us, for you have reached out to us in Jesus. May we do the same with those in need around us, and may you be the comfort that many need today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we turn to God's word, let's sing to his praise once again as in crying him with many crowns.
So my plan on this Lord's Day, morning and evening, is to take time in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 today to get a feel for this church. And we're going to focus on the first three verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So if you have your Bible open in front of you, that will help you and it will help me to know that you're following along with me. So please open your Bibles as we look at God's Word together today. 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 1 to 3. Ian Gray is an interesting character. He knows how to talk up a house. It's his job, for he's an estate agent. I don't know whether we have any estate agents here in Molesworth today, but his adverts for the latest houses on the market were the highlight of my weekly reading as they appeared in the local Scottish paper, the Falkirk Herald, whenever Julie and I lived in Scotland for a number of years during my studies. Whenever we lived there, I sometimes bought this local rag just to read Ian Gray's hard sale, for I've never read any descriptions quite like them. Here are some of his finest lines that I kept about the most average houses around the Falkirk area in central Scotland. He says, yes, sir, you love this one, spacious and certainly special. Or be warned, it's great, it's a bungalow, and it's smashing. Or, mighty good indeed, sir. Yes, it's super. Now, like any estate agent, Ian Gray is aware that settings also sell houses, and he was always very keen to include whether the house was near a good school or a large supermarket or if it was close to the local train or bus station. For we all know that location is important. As we come to 1 Thessalonians today, we're going to be thinking about three locations. Location number one, well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's Thessalonica. The first location is geographical. And Paul writes to these Thessalonians, but where did they live? Well, what kind of place was Thessalonica? Well, Salonica, as it's known today, is situated in Greece. It's part of the ancient province of Macedonia. It acted as a naval port for the Roman army and was a major city along the Ignatian Way, which was that long highway that that connected east to west right across the Roman Empire. It was the main motorway thoroughfare that stopped right here in Thessalonica. And in the first century, it was the second most important city alongside Athens. It was not only a bustling place, but it was a really beautiful place. And some of you may have traveled there. It had thermal springs and warm air that just continued to come in off the Aegean Sea. Thessalonica was a flourishing city with at that time a huge population, a gathering of a million people. Paul, Silas, Timothy, Dr. Luke first visited Thessalonica in the early AD 50s, having fled the city of Philippi where they'd been persecuted. Do you remember the story? Where they'd be, their backs had been lacerated. They'd been imprisoned in the central stocks in the prison cell until the Philippian jailer was dramatically converted. But we read that when Paul arrived in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, undeterred by the beatings that he had received, he reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue for three consecutive Sabbath days. You read about that in Acts 17 verses 2 and 3. We read, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, says Paul. And there's an immediate response, an encouraging response Didn't always happen for Paul this way, but we read on in Acts 17, verse 4, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But once again, as you see the pattern in the book of Acts, just like you see anywhere where God's spirit moves and people are converted, the evil one is never far behind. For it was not long before jealous Jews form a mob, started a riot, attacked the house where Paul was staying, and these new believers had to smuggle them out of the city at night. Paul hadn't spent very long with these new believers. He'd only been with them a matter of weeks, and they were so young in their faith that hardly had time to learn from Paul. Paul didn't have long to establish this new church in Thessalonica. He had to run for his life 
And that's why in his heart he has this longing to be back with them again. If you've got your Bibles open, you'll see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, his longing for these people. He says there, brothers and sisters, when we were torn away from you by being separated from you for a short time, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, wanted to come to see you again. Paul's writing this letter to encourage this group of people who had immediately faced persecution about four weeks after they'd been converted. Imagine that, just four weeks facing opposition and anxiety and mistrust and uncertainty. And Paul, who'd been the pastor that had brought them to faith, is out of the scene, out of the picture, simply able to correspond to them by writing. How hard must that have been for Paul and the church? He's remembering this small group of believers who are loved by the Lord, but located in Thessalonica where they're finding things tough. But in his opening words to this fearful and maybe even frightened group of Christians, look at what he says in verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 1. To the church of the Thessalonians, you need to get this. This is mind-blowing. In God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's staggering. Not only are they located geographically in Thessalonica, but here's location number two of three today. They are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never heard anything more staggering than that in your life. That as a believer... Trusting in Jesus Christ, you are located today in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the most amazing thing any of you have ever heard. These immature, under pressure Christians are in God and in Christ Jesus. Now, in is one of Paul's favorite prepositions. And don't worry if you've forgotten what a preposition is from your school days and your English grammar classes. It is simply a position of a person, place, or thing. I can remember one line of French. Le songe dans l'arbre. Poor old Mr. Moore. French teacher, he taught me for five years. And all I can remember is the monkey is in the tree. Le songe. Don Larbra. Don is in. The monkey is in the chain. You think I was bad? My friend, he did A level German. When confronted with the German football team stepping off a coach at Windsor Park, the only thing he could remember in German was the German for where is my sleeping bag? But prepositions, prepositions when things are on, in, over, under, behind. It's always in relation to something else. But this word in, it's the smallest of all of the prepositions, but it is the most incredible word. It is the most inspirational preposition that we have. For a start, Paul's words speak of safety and security. For those who are Christians are in God. Just let that dawn on you for a moment. And God being God, the high, holy, eternal God, cannot remove himself from himself. And we are in him. And we will never not be in him. That's where we are. We are part of who he is, sharing in his holiness, his grace, his power, his strength, his goodness, his kindness, his majesty, his might. To be in him means that he is the air that we breathe, the atmosphere in which we live as Christians. The surroundings that locate us as his people, as Christians, on a wet Tuesday morning or a frustrating Friday afternoon, whether you're stuck in traffic at the end of the M2 or the M1 or have a pounding headache, whether you're sitting in an exam hall doing GCSEs or A-levels, or even if you're confronted by your own sinfulness, if we are Christians, we're in God. He sees us as part of himself. 
There is a vital organic union with him. We are rooted in and live in him. Yes, God who created this world, the God who calls himself our father, the church that is God's gathered people, God's called out people in this world, whether living in Thessalonica or Cookstown or Moneymore or Macrofeld, to worship him by his grace, saved by his son's work on the cross, are rooted and will always be in him. Colossians 3, verse 3, Paul put it slightly differently. He says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And by hidden there, he doesn't mean that we're lost. (laughs) Paul means we're totally secure. We're locked in. And not only him, but because our God is in three persons, We are in the Lord Jesus Christ because of our faith in what Jesus has accomplished through his death and his resurrection. That means we share in his saving, victorious resurrection life. All he is, we will receive. All that he has accomplished, we share in. All that is his is ours. That is why on this Father's Day, because we are in Christ, we can dare to call the God who made us that we sinned against our Father in heaven. Christ died to do away with sin and end its power over us. So Christians are to share in that. Sin has no power now to bring us down into punishment again. Christ rose And so Christians share in this resurrected life. Even now we have that power that raised Christ from the dead, alive and at work in us. We share in his righteousness, his redemption, his resurrection. Nationality doesn't matter. Social background doesn't matter. Ethnicity plays no part of it. Our identity as Jew or Greek, whether we're brought up Presbyterian or Baptist, rich or poor, work as farmers or in finance, play rugby or cricket or married or single or six or 86 or sick or in good health. We've had a good week or a bad week. It doesn't matter to our Lord what he calls us to trust in that makes us his people. See how verse one goes on? It comes through grace and peace to you. That's Paul's unique greeting, grace and peace to you. Everyone in those ancient days would have opened a letter if they were writing it. And instead of saying hello, they used the Greek word karin, which means greetings, just general hello, greetings. But Paul switches the word from karin to the word that you will all know, charis, which means grace. That beautiful, life-transforming word Amazing grace, how sweet the sign, because it saves wretches like you and me and the Thessalonians. Paul reassures them that it's only through God's grace that we can then have the peace, grace and peace. That whatever these Thessalonians are thinking or feeling about their faith or their future, grace precedes peace. We can only have true peace, lasting peace, Deep-rooted, soul-saving, soundness of mind, peace, life-everlasting peace when we experience God's grace first. And what is God's grace? Well, it's that totally undeserved love that's offered to us in Jesus. That Jesus, our Savior, died in our place for our sin receiving his own body, the eternal payment for our sin that should have come our way. Jesus dying so that we might live. Christ's blood flowing and his body in agony in the sinner's place, taking hell and its consequences rather than us. That's grace. We'll only know mental peace, spiritual peace, lasting peace, doubt-conquering, death-defying peace when we receive that grace. You know, I know for a fact that some of us even seated here in Mulsworth or watching online are in anguish today because either we've forgotten that peace or never received that grace in the first place. If you're a Christian friend here today, I don't know what's causing your angst at the moment. I don't know what's disturbing your sleep pattern or troubling your conscience. Could be a sadness. Could be a deep-rooted grief. Could be a hurt from the past. 
It could be a family matter that's nagging away at you. It could be a financial constraint that's making you sweat. It could be a relationship that's blighted your days. It could be a workload that you just can't handle. It could be a sin that you haven't confessed. Whilst unbelieving friend, we're so glad you're here today because we really want you to hear this, that true peace in this life and true peace with God only comes when we receive the grace, the grace that comes from God's hand, the grace that is seen in the person of Jesus Christ. Of coming to that place when we look to Jesus and see him and all his wonderful hope that he reaches out to us, the, the one who has dealt with our sin, the one who reaches out with those nail-pierced hands in love. Folks, there's a need for all of us to find that peace again in God and through Jesus by means of grace. And when we do that today, we will know peace. And God isn't concerned in one sense about our feelings today or what others think of us or how the bullies at school maybe have taunted us or what our neighbors think of us or even what those in church say about us. Our God isn't concerned with how you look or the work you do. He wants us to be reassured that we're part of him and that makes us beautiful and of immovable and special because we're in him. Remember who you are today. Remember whose you are. Don't you want to be part of him? Don't we need to be reminded that we are so organically linked with him? For there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God when we're in Christ Jesus. Let's think about our third and final location today. These brothers and sisters in the faith, this church of God are located thirdly in Paul's heart. The heart of that first pastor with his people. Look at what he writes when he says, verse two, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father, your work prompt produced by faith, your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus. But look at verse two especially. We always thank God for all of you, continually mentioning you in our prayers. What warmth comes through even in these few words? You see, in just a sentence, Paul longs for his people with a pastor's heart. And who did we read about? Well, there was a group of converted Jews. There were a bunch of Greeks and there were these wealthy women. It seems a right mixture of people, doesn't it? Nothing in common. There was nothing to unite them before Paul brought the message of salvation to them. The walls of culture and race and wealth and poverty separate them. Now they just seem to crash down as they join together in this house fellowship. How strange it must have. Just, just picture it for a moment. Picture this. Right, there's Mrs. Jones. That grand lady from the big house and she opens the door of her house on that Sabbath day to the ex-Roman soldier who used to have a mouth like a sewer. And then there's Nathaniel and his wife Ruth, that Jewish couple who used to spend all their time worshipping at the synagogue. And then there's that right ragtag bunch who are going up the hill after them, and they look like slaves. And then Mrs. Jones is welcoming in, and she's hugging them. And she's delighted to see them. It looks as if they're actually friends. What's going on? The neighbors must think she's crazy. And then there's Mrs. Pettigrew. She, she's getting a lift in her four by four chariot coming from the mansions on the other side of the city. And then there's dear Jason. And we read what happened to Jason, didn't we, today? Well, he had been beaten up for sheltering Paul and his friends. And he still walks with a limp because his leg was so badly broken. And he still can't see properly out of one eye because of the beating he took for housing Paul and his friends. And he hobbles in. How the gospel has changed him. How the love of God has worked in his life. He's lost his home. He's lost his job. All for following Jesus. And still he wants to gather with the other Christians. And Paul can picture them all. It's almost like he's flicking through a family photograph album. He can see them all in his mind's eye and he's writing to them with love. And he remembers the day that each one of them saw the light when God opened their eyes so that they trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior. You see, at this moment, they aren't just located in God 
but the Holy Spirit is living in them. That's what changed their world. Church was now a place where people who didn't look like each other or wear the same clothes, you know, some were there in their finery, some were straight out of work and coming to church in their overalls and jeans. Some were able to put lots into the offering plate. Some hardly able to put anything in because they'd lost their jobs in following the Savior. This was a whole people created by God for God. Nothing brought these people together. The only common denominator was Christ. Let me get really personal here for you today in Molesworth. What brings you here today? Answer that in your heart. What brings you here today? And for those of you watching online who know you should be here, what's keeping you from coming back? Is it tradition? Habit? Because your parents brought you? You're even still sitting in roughly the same area that you sat before? Maybe you feel you're doing God a big favor. Maybe you know it's the right thing to do. Or maybe it's because this is the place where you meet with God and you just love to be with God's people. What a picture for us in First Thessalonians today. I think many of us have forgotten to see the church as Jesus sees it. How we must learn to see the church as Paul sees it. How we must learn to love the church as Jesus and Paul love it with intensity and passion and protection. When Paul thinks of the church that he's separated from these Thessalonians, he's not thinking about a building. He's thinking about people. Of course they had their faults. Read on in First Thessalonians this afternoon. You'll find out that some of the Thessalonians were really lazy. He wanted to put a rocket up them. Some had sinned sexually. They'd messed up. There was confusion over some details of theology that were getting it wrong. There was concern over worry about those who died and others who were ill and what would become of them. Paul doesn't dismiss them. Paul doesn't tell them they're not welcome. Paul prays for them. Paul has a joy in them. And he prays continually for them. So let me ask you today, the practical outworking of these few verses is, is that how you love the people of Molesworth? Do you share in the intense Christ-like love and longing to be here with one another? Yes, even sitting beside the people who frustrate you or disappoint you or even in the past might have offended you. Because church isn't for people just like you. Church is to display God's incredible saving grace in the lives of all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds, with all sorts of differences. And our challenge is, if we end up all just looking the same, talking the same, living in the same kind of houses, doing the same kind of jobs, then we're in terrible danger because we're not reflecting what the church of Jesus Christ should be. By God's amazing grace, it's for every specimen of human life because I'm in it and you're in it. You and I are just another weird and wonderful addition to God's worldwide plan. So let me leave you a challenge today. Do you pray for your church? When was the last time you prayed for someone here today that you don't know so well? When was the last time you opened up a conversation before or after our Sunday gatherings with someone you don't know? When was the last time we praised God for his church and the people within it? Why don't you pray and praise God for the people of this church every day in your own quiet times for a month? Don't just pray for the sick people. Don't just pray for the people that you know or the people that you like or the people you find it easy to relate to, but even the ones that you might have had a falling out with or those that you disagree with or those you disapprove of or have had history with or those you find it really hard to get along with, those younger people that you never speak to or if you're younger, those older people that you don't think you've anything in common with. I guarantee if you pray like that for over a month, the love for this place will grow. Your heart will change and this your church will become more and more like the church that God intends it to be. The Thessalonians were located in Thessalonica Located in God, located in Paul's heart. Location, location, location.
Kirsty Alsop and Phil Spencer have been hosting a property show on Channel 4 of the same name since the year 2000. Their premise based on the saying that the three most important factors in buying a house are location, location, location. Friends, I've just highlighted for you the three most important factors for any church. You're in a place, rooted in God. Are you located in each other's hearts? Friends, where else would you want to be than where God has placed us here and now in this place and amongst this community? In God, which is the safest, strongest, and most beautiful place to be, and in the hearts of fellow believers who love us and long to meet with us. So let that lead us on with Paul to continuing prayer and great praise. Amen. Let's sing to his praise as we finish our service by singing the lovely words of his mercy is more. Let's stand together and sing. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omnitude, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than the darkness, you every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patient would wait as he constantly roam? What father so tender, he calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than the darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood beneath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than the darkness, do every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than the darkness, do every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Father, we bless you for this place that you have us serving and worshipping today. We thank you as believers that we are located in God and our Lord Jesus Christ through faith and trust in Him. And may we be in one another's hearts, prayerfully sustaining each other in love. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with you all now and forevermore. Amen.